to cross by the railroad tracks. Written by William Dolphin. I saw something back in 1990 that has haunted me ever since. We were a Boy Scout troop of 16 boys between the ages of 13 and 17. Going on a two-day hike along the trail that ran 60 miles from Richmond to Marion, Indiana, three adults supervised us the entire way. They gathered us up on the north side of town one Friday after school in late September, checked our supplies and gear, and off we marched. Most of the journey that evening followed an old abandoned railroad track through farmer's fields. We managed to reach a small bit of forested area just before it got dark, and we pitched our tents there. We gathered wood for a fire and had our meals. After we ate, the grown-ups got out a couple of bags of marshmallows to roast, and we all sat around the fire where people had the chance to tell ghost stories. Many of the tales were the classic urban legends like the one about the woman who stopped at a gas station and found out that she had a serial killer hiding in her back seat. Another one was about two kids who parked somewhere late at night and only just barely escaped the mental patient with a hook for a hand. But for his third and final story, the troop leader told us all to get up and follow him. We left the safety of the fire and hiked up the ridge to where the railroad tracks were. He pointed down the line a ways, and we all something, saw something white in the distance. It was a cross set in the ground just to the side of the track. See that cross, he said? That marks the spot where Jack Hobbs died. Who is Jack Hobbs? Someone asked. This line used to connect Cincinnati to Chicago, but the legend has it back in 1909, an eastbound train from Chicago missed a switch point and ended up running head on into a westbound train near Muncie. 12 people died, dozens were injured. And four years after that, Farmers all up and down the line started complaining of hearing a train's whistle blowing in the middle of the night, but there were never any trains supposed to be going through at the times they claimed they heard them. Pretty soon the rumor spread that there were hearing was a ghost train carrying the souls of those 12 dead people never getting to their destination. Damn forever to ride the rails until the end of time. He paused and we all stood silently, listening for the sound of the train. Being a skeptic, I expected one of the other adults to sneak up behind us with something, but there was nothing but crickets and wind. After about a minute of unnerving silence, he continued. People started trekking out here from all over the place to try to catch a glimpse of the ghost train. One of those people was a guy named Jack Hobbs. He was sort of some sort of paranormal expert, I suppose, out of New York. He followed the tracks, kind of like we're doing. So, as the story goes, Jack Hobbs was following the tracks, carrying all manner of ghost-catching equipment, when all of a sudden, he saw a light come out of nowhere ahead of him on the track, and he heard the train's whistle in the air. The ghost train, he thought. I've actually seen the ghost train. He stood there in awe as the light grew brighter and brighter and the train's whistle grew louder just as he heard the screech 
of the metal as the brakes were hit, he realized too late that he was standing in the path of, the, of a very real, very powerful locomotive. The troop leader went quiet again. And almost exactly when he did, a loud train whistle screamed directly behind us, causing us all to jump. As we had expected earlier, one of the other grown-ups had sneaked up behind us to finish the story with a good scare. After we had settled down, we went back to the campsite and we got ready to go to sleep. I was partnered with a kid named Sant. Her turned out to be a heavy sleeper as well as a loud snorer. I wasn't used to having to share a space with someone else and the story of the ghost train had left me somewhat unnerved. So I found it hard to fall asleep then the adults went to bed, putting out the fire, and everything was pitch black, and the air was filled with animal noises, and there was no way I was going to get any seas tonight. I was lying there in my sleeping bag, listening to Sant snore, looking out towards the slope up to the track when all the hooting owls and the chirping crickets and the chittering squirrels suddenly went dead quiet. Sant snored once, rolled over and stopped snoring. Everything was absolutely silent. And when everything goes silent all of a sudden, my ears try to make up for the lack of sensory input by introducing this never-ending high-pitched sound. Even putting my hands over my ears couldn't drown it out because it was inside my head. When I gave up and uncovered my ears, I heard something else. I wasn't sure what to make of it at first. It was very faint, and it was coming from somewhere south down the tracks. Shh! Clop. Ch clop. Something was moving, I realized. Something shuffling the rocks and leaves as it slowly crept along. I tried to make out where it was coming from, but it was too dark to see anything. An unexplainable cold crept into my sleeping bag, and I started shivering despite several layers of clothing and an added blanket for warmth. I realized that the cold wasn't really there. It was just my body trying to explain why I was shaking so fiercely. The truth was, I was scared out of my mind, and this is what fear felt like. The moon came out from behind the clouds and the area by the train tracks got bathed in its blue light. I stared, straining to make out what was making the sound, but there was nothing visible, just the slow, methodical sound. I lay there in my bag and prayed someone else would wake up. A few seconds later, over the ridge I saw something move. It seemed to raise up a couple of inches with each repetition of the sound. Shh, clop, clop, and then back down. It was moving along the train tracks, coming down the line towards the camp shambling slowly. As it approached, the moonlight made it easier to see. I could distinctly make out someone's head and shoulders. He was marching slowly, eerily along. I thought he must have been walking alongside the rails on the other side of the slope. But after a minute of his steady gait, 
he came alongside our camp, and I saw, with grim horror, what, what it really was. It, it was a torso, just the upper half of a man. God is my witness. It was half a person pulling itself along on its elbows, dragging itself down the railroad track in the direction of the cross we had been shown. It was barely ten yards away from me, and the light wasn't that good, but I could make out its ragged, mangled features. Its head was badly mutated. Hair was missing in clumps. The ear that should have been visible on the side facing me was gone, and there was a deformity to its skull that made it look like a cracked egg. Its arms were bare. The shirt it wore would what? The shirt it wore was ragged and torn from what looked like years of dragging itself on its elbows. Every now and then, it hefted itself up onto its hands with a low groan. Shh. I could, I, I could hear, see sickening bits of its insides hanging out the ripped lower half of its abdomen. Clop. Clop. It dropped back down onto its elbows. This thing, this unfathomable wreck of a person, didn't seem to notice our camp. And I lay there shivering in my sleeping bag, praying each second that it would not look my way. Please, God, wake me up. Please, God Almighty, make it go away. It had to be a dream, I thought. This cannot exist. Then I heard it speak. Where are they? It was mumbling to itself. Where are they? It just said that over and over as it dragged on down the track and behind some trees out of my sight. I wanted to breathe a sigh of relief, but my heart was still racing and the air seemed trapped in my chest. I wish I could say that was the end of it. I wish I could say that I passed out and that I woke up the next morning. And I... I told everybody my story, and they all laughed at me. To this day, I'll never know what I saw was real. I was praying so hard for that, just for it to be a nightmare. But Sant woke up. He awoke with a loud snort, rolled over, and... Not seeing me, he fumbled out of his sleeping bag and got up. Sant, I whispered. Sant. But Sant groggily walked past the line of tents and stared, started up the hill to the railroad tracks. I lay there watching him go, wondering if maybe I had been dreaming after all and only now was waking up. Or maybe had this thing, this ghost only showed itself to me? To mock my fear? To wave my disbelief in my face? See, we do exist. Sant went past the tracks, down the other side to the point all I could see was his shoulders and head. From there, he looked much like the shambling thing that had looked when I first saw it. And again, I was stricken with doubt. I could hear him sigh and the sound of piss hitting the ground. And then what I heard, sh, clop, sh, clop, 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 clop. 
Before I could even scream, I saw it. The thing, the half-man, moving at a frightening, frightening, frighteningly. I, I can't even write this down properly or speak properly. It, it was moving at such a speed on its hands. It's destroyed lower half roughly flying across the ground as it moved. It made the distance from the edge of the trees to where Sant stood in a matter of seconds. And just as it got there, it screamed, Where are they? Sant never made a noise. It reached him before he could even look and the piddling of his urination disappeared in the same instant he did. There was a sound I can't... I, I cannot even begin to describe. Then another like someone was tearing open a burlap sack of potatoes. Finally, a wet splash followed by something heavy hitting the ground and tumbling down the hill. By then, I didn't need to scream. The moment the thing yelled, several people woke up. Nobody seemed to see where the noise had come from, but they shouted in surprise, and their shouting woke up others, and in less than a minute the whole troop was awake and tr trying to find their flashlights. Finally, I unfroze and I started screaming, Sant! It got Sant! And thrashing around in my sleeping bag, trying to get my hands free in order to point. Everybody stay here. Get a fire going, the troop leader yelled. And he and one of the other adults ran up the hill to the tracks and started searching around with, with their flashlights. The other kids were asking me, what was it? What got sand? And I realized I didn't know what to tell them. Half a man? Half a ghost? What the hell was I supposed to tell them I saw? So I did what any 13-year-old would do. Jack Hobbs. It was Jack Hobbs. He was cut in half by the train and was crawling on his elbows. Yeah, that went over... <laughs> That went over well with everybody, of course. We heard the other guy that had gone up the rise with the troop leader suddenly shout, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph! And there was a mad scramble as everybody tried to run up to the tracks to see what had happened. The troop leader caught us before the top, red-faced and bulging eyes. He started yelling. Everybody get back. Everybody stay back. Get to the fire. There might be a bear nearby. A bear? Somebody asked. Gather up your gear, a third grown-up ordered. The second adult returned, wiping at his forehead and looking paler than I'd ever seen anyone look before. They, three of them, held a little meeting together, away from the rest of us while we all huddled around a newly made fire and I was bombarded with questions about what I had seen. I tried to describe it, but it seemed so surreal that it was almost like walking from a dream where bits and pieces of memory fade before you and you just can't describe them. I realized that the more I spent trying to describe it, the more insane I sounded. It was decided that the troop leader and the third grown-up would stay put, while we kids were marched to the nearest farm to find a phone and call the police and our parents. Fifteen boys between the ages of thirteen and seventeen, numb with fear and horror, guided by a single adult through the dark at night along the abandoned railroad tracks until we hit a cornfield and marched nervously and cautiously through the tall stalks of corn trying to keep tabs on each other. 
The rest of the night was a blur. I barely remember the details of the farmhouse as we waited. The folks who let us come in and use their phone were trying to be so kind and understanding. I don't remember most of the Saturday either. I remember my parents picking me up before the sun was up, and I remember talking to the police officer in a uniform about my version of the events. I remember drinking a glass of milk and feeling like my stomach was churning. But the timeline of what happened when was just so completely jumbled. The official conclusion was that sand had been mauled by a bear, literally torn in half by it. I didn't get the gritty details, but I've never really wanted them. Honestly, I barely knew him. Having only first met him at that troop meeting three weeks prior to our hike, I quickly refused to talk about what I had seen. I told too many kids that night that I ended up going to school with. Before I even had a chance to really make any friends, I had become known as the weird kid who saw the bear that killed Sant and thought it was a ghost. One guy even accused me of being directly responsible for his death. He might have been right. I know what I saw, though. It was no bear. I don't like to go camping anymore for obvious reasons. I've tried, but the few times I've managed to handle it long enough to fall asleep, I can hear that sound in my dreams. Shh, clop, shh, clop. And I always wake up screaming. <laughs>